welcome to Perimeter Institute's public lecture series. My name is Greg Dick. I am the Senior Director of Public Engagement and Advancement here at Perimeter Institute. Before we begin this evening, in the spirit of respect and reconciliation, we acknowledge that Perimeter Institute is located upon the lands that have been inhabited by Indigenous people from the beginning. In particular, we acknowledge the Haldeman Tract, the traditional territory of the Ashinaabeg, the Atawandran, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. As settlers, we thank all of the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. We are connected to our collective commitment to make the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our communities. Tonight's lecture is part of Perimeter's public lecture series. It is our longest running public outreach program. Now, Perimeter is a not-for-profit charity, an organization, and these public uh, science events are part of our commitment to sharing exceptional and engaging science. Thank you for joining us tonight as we continue to broadcast from our socially distant studio here at Perimeter Institute. We are fortunate to be able to continue to bring the tradition of our public lecture series while keeping everybody safe. As you watch the lecture from the comfort of your home, I encourage you to join the conversation online. We are at Perimeter on Twitter, and you can use the hashtag PILive to chat with perimeter scientists and to ask questions of tonight's guest speaker. Given that our view for the last year has been limited to what we can see outside of our own window, we're starting 2021 by looking outward into the vast and wonderful universe. And to help us with that, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Priya Natarajan. Dr. Natarajan is a professor in the Department of Astronomy and Physics at Yale University where she is also the director of the Frank Program in Science and the Humanities. She has served as the chair of the Division of Astrophysics of the American Physical Society and currently serves on the National Astronomy and Astrophysics Advisory Committee that advise, uh, advises NASA, the National Science Foundation, and the Department of Energy. She is also an active member of the NASA-LISA science team which is working on the first dedicated space-based gravitational wave detector. Dr. Natarajan has received many awards and honors in recognition of her contributions in science, including the Guggenheim and Radcliffe Fellowships. She also holds the Sophie and Tycho Brahe Professorship at the Dark Center of the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen, and an honorary professorship at the University of Delhi in India. She received her PhD in astrophysics at the University of Cambridge's Institute of Astronomy, where she was the first woman in astrophysics to be elected a fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge. Deeply invested in the public understanding of science, she serves on the advisory boards of several leading publications, such as Nova Science Now, Quantum Magazine, and Scientific American. She is also the author of Mapping the Heavens, the radical scientific ideas that reveal the cosmos. As a prominent researcher in the, field of, in the field of astrophysics, Dr. Natarajan's research focuses on exotica in the universe, dark matter, dark energy, and black holes. Tonight, she will share with us current research of what is known about the nature of dark matter and black holes. Welcome, Priya. How are you this evening? I'm very well, thank you, and absolutely delighted to join you, even though it's virtual. I would have liked to be there in person, but well, hey, this feels wonderful too. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We are so grateful uh, to have you with us tonight and so looking forward to it. And maybe just before you begin, where are you coming to us from since you can't be here in person? So I am in my apartment, cozy little apartment in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, which is where I live, um, and I'm sitting in my study, and I can just show you all, all the books that are lined up everywhere around, <laughs> and I'm sitting on a comfortable chair, and it feels like I'm talking to friends, which is one of the, one of the blessings of the, um, uh, sort of the virtual meeting, um, the disadvantage is not withstanding, uh, notwithstanding is the sense of comfort that one feels just sort of being at home. Well, and uh, our audience, as you're streaming into their living rooms, are feeling the same thing. So this is wonderful. So why don't we get right started? Uh, we look forward to hearing 
your presentation, and then we'll uh, have a conversation, some question and answers at the end. It's all you. Thank you very much. So um, first, I want to thank the Perimeter Institute uh, and the organizers of this public talk series for giving me this wonderful opportunity to share the excitement, the passion, and the uh, you know the sort of uh, anticipation of fantastic new results that are expected very, very soon uh, in these fields in cosmology, sort of fast moving fields in cosmology. So I'm really, uh, it's a pleasure and an absolute privilege to have this opportunity. So I will just, uh, without uh, further ado, I will move on to my slides. And let me see my sharing screen. Hopefully you can all uh, see the screen. Okay, so um, I want to talk today about um, the invisible universe. And when my own personal interests, um, as was mentioned in this very generous introduction, really has to do with the dark side of our universe the sort of the dark entities that we now understand, have come to understand, shape the past, present, and future of the universe. And today, in particular, I will be focusing on two sets of entities. One uh, is dark matter, which, as I will show you, is pretty much in the driving seat of the formation of all structures, all structures uh, visible and invisible in the universe and black holes um, that we now believe inhabit pretty much the center of every galaxy. And these enigmatic objects were believed to be quite marginal till quite recently. And the work of the last decade or so has shown that um, these bizarre objects uh, also play a fundamental role in shaping galaxies. So once again, we have these two invisible entities that play a very important role in rendering uh, the visible universe. So, you know, um, throughout history, the visible universe, what we can see when we look up in the night sky has always been the portal to the invisible universe. And the universe has been invisible in the past often I'm talking about historically human uh, in terms of human history is because of the limits of our eyes. So we were first limited with the naked eye astronomy and could only see what was accessible to our eye. And then of course, with the uh, invention of the telescope, our natural vision was expanded. And then since then there has been a revolution of ideas and instruments, this confluence of ideas and instruments that has driven our knowledge of the cosmos and has fundamentally frequently reshaped our cosmic view with newer and newer discoveries. So a lot of uh, the material that I'm gonna be talking about uh, is of course going to bring you to the frontline research and new results and the predictions and what is anticipated in terms of discoveries in the coming decade or so. But um, if you're interested for the sort of broader context, um, uh, I would like to um, invite you to uh, look at my book, um, Mapping the Heavens. So um, as I mentioned, you know, ever since we could look up at the night sky, human beings have been trying to uh, find their place in the cosmos. We're trying to see how we fit into this grand scheme of things. And of course, what must have been perplexing and remains perplexing today too, is the regularity of the cosmos. The, the predictability and the regularity of the cosmos that suggests that there are some underlying principles. So one of the earliest sort of depictions that we uh, believe of the night sky that are available now is this nebra sky disk, which we believe shows the sun, the moon, and the star cluster Pleiades. This was found in the uh, Saxony-Anhalt region of Germany, and it's dated to about 2000 BC. And then my own favorite are the artifacts that record the night sky that reveal the pre human preoccupation with the cosmos. There were many civilizations around the world that uh, did it, but 
the Mesopotamians were some of the most inveterate mappers of the night sky. And so this is a little piece that I'm showing you of the Venus sky tablet in which what they recorded were the locations of the planet Venus. And at this point, it should astound you that the Mesopotamians in 700 BC knew the difference between a star and a planet. Um, and then, of course, when we move on to uh, 1200, 1300 um, AD, remember this is before the telescope. The telescope doesn't come till about 1609. Um, there is an understanding of wanting to find causes for the regularity of the cosmos. However, the things that you couldn't explain are now attributed to an invisible agent. So you have an invisible entity, often divine, um, and that is attributed to the shifting cosmos that we see. And of course, you all know that some of the most fundamental changes in the conception of cosmos occurred in the transition from the Aristotelian Ptolemaic view, which was the geocentric view of the uh, solar system. And remember at this time, the cosmos was the solar system uh, to the Copernican um, solar system, the Copernican universe in which the earth is supplanted uh, by the sun at the center of the solar system and the planets revolve around the sun. So this was a very big dramatic shift but interesting, interestingly, we see when we look at the arc of the history of ideas of our cosmic view and how that shifts, we can often see that in maps. And one of my favorite maps, I want to get this um, out there because, you know, as you'll see when I talk about my own work and what motivates me uh, is that I'm a bit of a map nut. And, and I think that there is a way in which maps encode the limits of our knowledge at any given time. And even our current maps actually reveal how much we actually know and how much remains to be discovered. So what is still terra incognita? So this is an old map, it's a favorite of mine. It's an illuminated map, against, again, from about 1375 to 1400. And what you see is the struggle, is this human struggle for explanation and here, the seasons and day and night are attributed to two angels turning the crank. So um, the quest for an explanation for cosmic regularities uh, is a long one. But luckily for us, now we are at a fantastic place uh, in time and we have mapped the cosmos exquisitely and we now have a really good inventory of the universe. So we now know that the universe uh, comprises in terms of its uh, constituents, primarily dark entities. We think that the bulk of the energy, the total energy density of the universe is dominated by a bizarre component called dark energy, whose nature we don't know. We know what it does, we don't know what it is. And similarly, we believe that the bulk of the matter contribution of the universe is provided by this other peculiar entity called dark matter, which is once again uh, elusive and invisible. And all the ordinary atoms, everything in the periodic table, all the stuff that we're made of is a mere 5% of uh, the matter, uh, of the overall uh, mat um, budget of the universe. And so now um, you might say, okay, how do we actually know that this is the precise inventory? So we've had multiple independent lines of observational evidence that have provided us with this inventory. And today, as I mentioned earlier, I'll be talking about two sets of invisible entities. One that forms uh, a dominant portion of the matter budget, which is dark matter and uh, the other, which although it doesn't appear as a significant sliver in this, it turns out that our universe is actually littered with black holes of different sizes. There's a bestiary of black holes and we'll come to that later. And so first I want to show you what the evidence for dark matter is. There is compelling evidence for the existence of dark matter and in this proportion that is shown in this green, uh, pizza slice in this pie chart. And, and one of the reasons I want to spend time showing you these many independent lines of evidence is that 
historically during medieval times, we've had invisible entities. And I've just told you that dark matter is invisible. And I want to show you that dark matter is very different from these medieval fluids, invisible fluids like progestone or ether and so on. Uh, because, precisely because there are two compelling lines of evidence. And these lines of evidence are particularly compelling because one is a very Newtonian view of gravity. And the other one comes from the reconceptualization of Newton's gravity that Einstein gave us, his theory of general relativity. So one comes from a phenomenon that Einstein predicted, which is the bending of light by matter. And the other comes straight up from Isaac Newton, which is the impact of gravity that manifests in the motions of stars. So before I um, sort of delve into the details of dark matter, I just wanted to also give you uh, a sense of our current cosmic view that we have a very, very good idea of the timeline of the universe and the various significant events in this timeline of the universe. We know that the age of the universe is approximately 13.8 billion years. And we know, and we have data going right back, direct data going right back to about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And we know when the first sets of galaxies form. So we are able to date the events, astrophysical processes we know operate to provide the conditions that would permit the formation of the first stars, the first galaxies and black holes. And we also know how galaxies evolve over time. And one of the things that we have uh, understood at the moment is that what drives this entire story of assembly of structure is in fact dark matter. And so dark matter is really the scaffolding on which the entire universe is built. And it drives over cosmic time, it drives the formation of all structures, including all the visible elements of the universe. So now jumping into um, dark matter, coming back to our cosmic inventory and diving into the evidence for dark matter. So what is amazing about dark matter is that conceptually and empirically, there was a claimed detection of the effects of dark matter. Once again, like dark energy, what we know about dark matter, as you'll see, we don't yet know what the particle is that actually constitutes dark matter. We believe it forms sometime very early on in the universe and it's ubiquitous. And as I said, it drives the entire cosmic show. However, we don't know the mass, precise mass of that particle or the nature of that particle. What we know is how it behaves in aggregate. It has mass, therefore it aggregates due to gravity and we see it's gravitational, the effect that it exerts on other visible entities in the universe like stars. So the first inference for the indirect detection, if you will, inference of the existence of dark matter can be dated back to the 1930s. And in fact, it was Fritz Zwicky, an astronomer at Caltech, who was measuring the motions of galaxies in a cluster of galaxies. A cluster of galaxies is about a thousand galaxies that appear to be held together in equilibrium. And we now know that it is dark matter that is the glue that is holding it, but Zwicky did not know that. But what Zwicky did notice from the measurements of the motions of galaxies around in this cluster, he noticed they were whizzing around a little too fast. In fact, so incredibly fast that there had to be a reason why they were not flying apart and flying away. And if they were held together, so he used the argument of the exceptionally high velocity speeds of these galaxies in a cluster in this nearby coma cluster uh, to make the case that there was unseen matter, dunkel materi, dark matter, that exerts gravity and that actually holds these structures together. Of course, um, it was um, it was a speculate it was a speculation at the time, and it did not catch. And you know, this idea was not taken very seriously. But you know, Zwicky was not one to give up very easily. So, as I mentioned, this is a very Newtonian argument by just looking at the impact of the gravity of this unseen matter and the impact on the motions, right? And so in 1937, remember by now in 1915 already, Einstein had proposed his theory of general relativity and he had predicted light deflection 
And you may all know that, you know, the first sort of um, observational evidence for his theory came from light deflection measured during a solar eclipse. So that there was, you know, a well quantified effect. And Zwicky realized that if indeed he was right about the amount of dark matter that should be sitting around in a cluster like coma, then that dark matter would actually cause light deflections. And he computed the light deflections. So here we have two independent ways. And these are ways that we have followed through over the decades. So a la Newton, a la Einstein. So he measured, he, he uh, predicted what the deflections would be, the light bending that we produced by the matter that he infers should be in coma from the motions. It turns out those deflections were very small. They were undetectable at the time. So once again, this idea sort of languished till the 1970s when it re-emerged on a completely different scale. And it took a while to make the connection that it was the same dark matter that was being measured. And this came from the work of Vera Rubin um, and Kent Ford and collaborators. So they were working on something slightly different. They were on a system which is an individual galaxy and they were trying to map the motions of stars inside a galaxy. So they were trying to map what we call a rotation curve, the speeds of stars as a function of the distance from the center of uh, a, a spiral galaxy. In their case, the first measurements were made for spiral galaxies. And so they found something very, very peculiar, quite akin to what um, uh, Zwicky had found. They found that the rotation curve for stars in a galaxy does not actually fall off like the red curve, which is expected if all the matter that you see in the galaxy is just the visible stuff that you see, stars and gas and so on. And what they measured was actually this white curve. And that was very puzzling. It appeared that there was something literally that appeared to be holding up the galaxy at the outer edges. And so, um, you know, they actually sat on these results. They enlarged the sample of galaxies, but they were making these measurements and they eventually published this. And it was a pretty radical idea uh, when they published it. Luckily for them uh, in the late 70s, it was an idea that also caught fire theoretically. And it became clear that for galaxies to, individual galaxies to actually be stable, they required another extra component, a dark component. Meanwhile, to understand why this is so radical, let's just take a quick look at the solar system. So if you look at the solar system, the sun is the most massive gravitating body in the solar system. And you have the planets that are arranged that are um, orbiting the sun. And if you measure the speeds of the planets around the sun, what you find is Mercury is moving the fastest and then it actually, uh, the uh, outer planets take are moving much more slowly. They take much longer and longer to do one full orbit. And so what this is showing you that the bulk of the matter, the gravity of the solar system, the dominant component, the dominant contributor is actually the sun and it's at the center. And that there is, and these, the planets are pretty much like test particles. They're just sampling the gravity of the sun. They are not massive enough in of themselves to actually make a difference. So you see this rotation curve that actually falls down. And you can see this is fundamentally different from what is found, uh, uh, what Vera Rubin and others found uh, for galaxies. So what this tells you is that the gravitating matter is not concentrated in the center, but it's actually distributed in a very extended fashion. So, and that is the origin of the word dark matter halo. So we now believe that it turns out that this was not just one galaxy, but many galaxies that they measured had these rotation curves that were flat, that appeared to be held up with additional gravitating material. So just to show you the contrast, it's the mass, the details of the mass distribution are fundamentally different in the solar system and in galaxies. Therefore, on the right, you see a little cartoon of our current conception of galaxies. We believe that the visible portion of a galaxy, the stars and the gas are just the tip of the iceberg. And that the mass distribution of a galaxy 
which is predominantly dark matter, extends well beyond spatially, and that the overall mass of a galaxy is actually dominated by dark matter. And this is how you get the pie chart that we saw, and you could immediately see that, aha, if this is the conception for every galaxy, and therefore the bulk of the matter, it makes total sense that the bulk of the matter in the universe uh, is dark matter. So now let's move to, let's now see where Zwicky's other idea, which was the light deflections, how far that takes us now. So now that we have telescopes that can actually measure these deflections, and in particular, a lot of the work that I'm gonna show you, results that I'm going to show you on mapping dark matter, uh, from the exquisite measurements of the bending of light uh, using the Hubble Space Telescope. So that's been a transformative uh, instrument and tool for all of this work. So here's a schematic of how the light bending works. So if you have a distant galaxy that is shown in this sketch, and you have an intervening cluster of galaxies, which we just saw are about a thousand galaxies, and now we know each of those little thousand galaxies has its own little dark matter halo. And there's a larger dark matter halo, a distribution of dark matter that's associated with the overall cluster. That's the glue that holds it together. So this was, remember, Zwicky's postulate. It turns out he was right. And so this dark matter, lump of dark matter, then bends light from the distant object. So when we open up our telescopes or we observe with the Hubble Space Telescope on Earth, what we end up seeing, we end up seeing a distorted image of that distant galaxy. But the way in which it is distorted is very systematic and it's, it's predictable and we can actually map it. And the reason we can map that is that our view to most galaxies in the universe is actually undistorted. We get a clear cut view, so we know the undistorted shapes of galaxies. Galaxies are born with a set of native shapes, but we know that distribution. And clusters of galaxies, which are extremely massive objects, they're about 10, 10 to the 15 times the mass of the sun. That's the total mass, including the dark matter in these entities. These are very rare objects. They assemble uh, in the universe, structure assembles hierarchically, so little lumps form uh, early on and these kinds of massive objects form very late in the universe. So these are very recently assembled structures. They are rare. So luckily, when we look out into the night sky, we are not looking through a you know, full patchwork of clusters. They're very rare. So in the regions where there are clusters, we see extreme distortions. But we are able to calibrate them because most of the rest of the universe that we see is not as strongly distorted. So for example, here's an example. It's a real image from the Hubble Space Telescope. In this particular case, the lens in this case is actually an individual galaxy because remember the individual galaxies also have a lot of dark, dark matter that can also deflect light. And our optics are good enough now to actually make those measurements. So uh, what we see with the Hubble Space Telescope is this central big image which is a really mangled blue background galaxy that almost looks like a full circle, pulled out into, stretched out into a full circle. And what you see on the right-hand panel is the kind of forensic work that modelers like me do, that we now have we a very large community of people who now will dissect this and will actually tell you recover the original undistorted shape of this galaxy. And that's the blue fuzzy thing. That's the distant galaxy. And what you see in the middle panel is the distribution of matter in this intervening galaxy that acts as the lens and bends the light and what it does and how it mangles that distant galaxy. So this is all extremely well understood. Because we see the visible part of this galaxy, and we see the distortion, we know how much matter you need to produce this extreme distortion. We can back out the total amount of dark matter in that galaxy. And this is what we do. And this is how we map dark matter. And so we can do this on the scale of individual galaxies because you know individual galaxies have their own dark matter component, or as we just saw, clusters of galaxies where these lensing effects, the strength of the distortion is directly proportional to the amount of matter that you have. And since clusters are much more massive, they produce dramatically uh, dramatic lensing effects. So one other 
curious lensing effect. You know, if you uh, think about it, you might want to think about light as sort of a tube, a tube that is, you know, traveling to us from the distant object to us, and it's getting bent on its way. So when you have a very dense, very massive uh, object, and you have things line up just behind the lens, so this foreground object we refer to as a lens because it does exactly what optical glass lenses that you know your your spectacles or magnifying glass does. And what you find is that this tube of light can actually split into multiples. And that splitting, what does that do? How does that manifest? It manifests as the production of multiple images of the same object. So you see multiple copies of the same individual, a single background object. And how do we know they are multiples of the same? Aha. So it turns out all objects in the universe have the equivalent of a cosmic fingerprint. So they have a spectrum. So you go out and you take the spectrum, you see they're identical. And the probability in the raw of that happening is quite unlikely. And then there are these configurations. I said, this is all calculable. We know the geometries, we know where these multiple images should um, are likely to be found given the mass distribution. So here is a Hubble Space Telescope image of a cluster of galaxies, very massive. And that's a dramatically good lens. It's a great distorter. And what you see marked in yellow are these four images of the same background object. And in the inset, you can see from these four images. So there's actually a fifth image. And this is a, a little test for you guys. It's right at the center. You can see right off the center of the bright galaxies in the cluster, you can see this sort of fifth blue image. So these four images you can see are really, you can map them back to obtain the original undistorted shape of the galaxy like we did here. And you find that it's a galaxy that has a peculiar shape like a bit of a, a bicycle wheel or something. So this is another, and you might say, okay, well, maybe these are very, uh, you know, you said they are rare, but maybe this doesn't happen as frequently. It turns out they're rare, but they're not that rare. So here's another dramatic cluster lens where even by eye, you can see all the distorted arcs and arclets of background galaxies that are getting lensed by the foreground cluster. And how can you tell what's in front and what's in back? Of course, you have spectra, but you also have colors. So what you see is the yellow fuzzy stuff are the galaxies that belong to the foreground cluster that's doing the lensing. So what is the kind of work? I just want to give you a flavor. We don't have time to delve into it. Uh, you know, feel free to uh, visit my webpage where I have lots of details of the work and papers and codes and things like that. So what we really do, so this foreground object replete with dark matter behaves like a lens. So we can actually quantify and produce the magnification pattern of this mass distribution. And that inadvertently allows you to map the dark matter itself because that is the map of dark matter. So to show you what, what is the kind of work that we do. So you see the uh, Hubble Space Telescope image. Now this is one of the deepest images of a cluster. And this is a very complicated cluster, which is quite elongated. It's like a couple of clusters smashing into each other. It turns out such objects are very good lenses. They produce very dramatic lensing effects. And so using the more than thousand galaxies whose shapes are mangled background galaxies that lie beyond the cluster, we are able to reconstruct the dark matter distribution. And that's what is shown and overlaid in blue over here. So you can see that the dark matter distribution, it's much more extended, although it does kind of follow the light. It's very, very extended and there's quite a lot of it. Um, and so then what we can do is we can convert those blue fuzzy um, maps that I showed, I showed you into a map that you can visualize slightly differently because you can, then visualize it as how dark matter is actually clumped. How is it spatially distributed? And that gives you this kind of contour map. This is the kind of map those of you who are hikers would have seen. It's like a topographical map. And so we can make these maps and these are real maps showing you the aggregation uh, and the granularity of dark matter spatially in a region that corresponds to that cluster lens. And you might say, okay, this is great. It's all very pretty. So anyway, this is a very pretty map. As I, I warned you already that I'm a bit of a map nut. So this is my favorite map. This was from my research group produced a few years ago. And this is one of the highest resolution dark matter maps uh, ever produced. And so what is the utility of this map? Like, what are we gonna do with this map? So it turns out, as I told you, that dark matter is in the driving seat for um, 
in our current paradigm in terms of understanding how structure forms. And this theory is called the cold dark matter theory. And we, the way we understand this theory and the evolution of structure formation over time is a numerical simulation. So if you go to a numerical simulation, this is a region marked in yellow is a region that would become what we call a cluster in the real universe. But what I'm showing you there is just a map of the dark matter. So, and I'm also gonna show you an old simulation of dark matter only. It's mocked up to look like light, um, but this is just the way dark matter assembles. And remember dark matter does not interact um, with any other force other than just gravity. So this is all gravitational aggregation. All the yellow stuff that you see are little lumps of dark matter that are aggregating due to gravity and they will end up forming uh, a cluster of galaxies. So this is a region that will form a cluster of galaxies. And you can see how many itsy bitsy pieces there are. So it's very granular. You have lots of little um, clumps of dark matter and you have some bigger clumps. So it's kind of, there's a distribution. So obviously what we would really like to do is to compare the distribution, this contour map that I obtained and look at a simulation to see if this is a good representation of the granularity of um, dark matter that cold dark matter theory predicts. And so these have been very, very fruitful ways to constrain the nature of dark matter. As I said, we are yet to detect the particle that is actually dark matter. So we need all these indirect clues. And this is what astrophysics is going to give us because astrophysics is going to be sensitive not to the individual particle, but aggregates of these particles to give you this kind of macro phenomena of light bending motions and so on. And the reason this is still worthwhile, not just worthwhile, but really illuminating, um, sorry to use that pun, but this is the distribution of dark matter in two different clusters, regions that would form clusters from simulations in which we've changed the nature of dark matter. The one that you see on the left, the one with lots of granularity is cold dark matter. And the one that you see on the right that is smoothed over is another dark matter candidate, a warm dark matter candidate. So this is what sort of the power of cluster lensing allows you to do, allows you to use the granularity of dark matter as a real test of the theory of our understanding of structure formation, as well as the nature of dark matter itself. So hot off the press, I have kept telling you, I've, I've uh, kept telling you that we have not had a direct detection of the particle of a dark matter particle. So what do we expect them to be? We expect them to be broadly two classes. There are many, many candidates. There can be any kinds of, but the issue is that we have to produce enough of them at the right amount at the right time in the universe so that they dominate and give you the right inventory today and corresponding to our measurement of that pie chart that I showed you, the green slice. So there are two kinds of particles that have been kind of very fashionable um, and they, one of them is slightly more massive class and those are weakly interacting massive particles. And the other class are called axions and these are lighter than WIMPs. And sort of the inferred properties that explain all the clustering that I've talked to you about, everything that we've inferred so far is that we believe these dark matter particles are kind of cold, i.e. they travel very slowly compared to the speed of light and they are collisionless, they do not interact, so they don't have any pressure, they, in, they aggregate only due to gravity, and they have almost no interactions with each other, any other kind of interactions. That's what we believe from the phenomenology of over a range of scales, and as I said, many independent probes, that's what we have inferred. So this is the cold dark matter universe. And so far, it's kind of holding up, although there may be some cracks. And you know, you can ask me in the questions. I don't have time to go into those details. But what is very exciting is results that came out yesterday. And so the only ever potential detection, particle detection of dark matter was claimed by an experiment, particle physics experiment with the sodium iodide um, crystal through which we believe dark matter might have passed through and that's what you detect. It sort of jiggles the crystal in a simplistic way. I'm explaining this to you. And so there was a claim detection by a collaboration called Dama Libra almost two decades ago. And only recently, um, you know, one of the sad things in science is, you know, you have to be able to duplicate results, right? But there are issues with funding, but very recently, about five, seven years ago, uh, funds were approved for multiple duplications of the same sodium iodide cluster 
uh, made by the same, fabricated by the same company, three different collaborations, different parts of the world, two of them have turned in results already. They have not been able to replicate the claim detection. So that's very interesting. So I think at this moment, um, it would be fair to say we are yet to detect dark matter for our purposes. So now let me move on to black holes, another set of super enigmatic objects and um, that are in a way that what is enigmatic about them is the peculiarness of their properties. However, they're really, really simple. You need to know just three numbers to characterize a black hole. You need to know its mass, you need to know its spin, and its charge. It turns out in astrophysics, the charges of black holes are not as relevant. And therefore we really, it's just the mass and the spin. So in terms of modeling for someone like me, like a theorist, it's heaven, right? It's like two parameters and you can really play with trying to understand their true nature. So as I mentioned, one of the things that, you know, I was researching the uh, origin of the term black hole, strangely, it, um, it originates from India and well before we knew anything about black holes. And, you know, black holes were actually uh, the black hole solution, as we'll see in a minute, was actually uh, a solution to Einstein's field equations that are part of his theory of general relativity. Because remember, this reformulation of gravity came from Einstein and a lot of these sort of gravitational phenomena come from uh, there. But this term black hole was already in use in Calcutta in 1756 and it referred, strangely, it referred to a prison, a prison where the local Nawab had actually captured soldiers from the, the mercenary soldiers of the East India Company, who you know, eventually colonized India, but this is before the Raj was really uh, got going in India. And these soldiers were uh, captured and left overnight in this place from which the lore is that most of them died. And so it was a place of no return. So that's what the black hole means. And we'll see that scientifically, the properties of a black hole really align incredibly with this idea of point of no return, which predates uh, the black hole solution. So um, as I said, these are enigmatic objects and they're kind of complex, but there is, I can offer three different ways. I have found these three different ways to think about them to be very useful. And, um, and they are three important ways because they allow you to make sense of them in three different contexts. Of course, it's very complicated when you have to put everything together, okay? So I will, I will try to get you there, but to, uh, to dip your toe into it. So one of the first ways in which we can think about black holes is we can think of them as uh, places with extreme gravity, with um, very, very strong gravitational pull. So an analogy, right? So if you look at the earth and you look at the notion of escape speed, it's a measure of the strength of earth's gravity. So for example, for a rocket, well, you know, the latest uh, Starlink thing had to be uh, aborted yesterday, but we have been very successful in launching uh, rockets. Um, and so to launch a rocket to escape Earth's gravity, you need, it has to have a speed of about 11.2 uh, 11 kilometers per second. And that's why we need booster, you know, boosters and we need rocket fuel to boost it out of the grip of Earth's gravity. So now imagine, so that's a measure of the strength of gravity. So imagine now that you had a region of space from which the escape speed, the escape from its gravitational grip was the speed of light. Now that's a black hole, that's a definition of black hole. So one way to think about it is that if matter, if all of the earth was packed really, really tightly into a very tiny region, that's the kind of intensity of gravity it would have. So for, for the Earth to behave like it was a black hole, you'd have to pack all the matter in the Earth, us and everything, into less than a centimeter radius. And so that's how, so you can think of it as a density of packing and therefore intensity of gravity. As I tell you, these are three different ways. They're sort of all simplifications, but they're sort of useful simplifications. Okay? So one can't go too far with them. However, this one way of thinking about black holes we know is actually ratified. And this is bona fide because black holes are also the dense corpses that are left behind after the life cycle of extremely massive stars. So stars that are above eight to 10 times the mass of the sun, they go through evolution, their life cycle, and at the end of their life cycle, when they've exhausted all their nuclear fuel, they'll go through a supernova explosion, 
and they could either leave you a neutron star or a black hole. So we can think of black holes also as the compact remnants of stellar death. So stellar death leaves these sort of remnants that are very compact and black holes. And so this we know, um, and we know we have proof as I'll show you, um, as with dark matter, I'm gonna show you evidence. What is the observational empirical evidence, evidence that you know, holds up and ratifies this conceptual understanding that I'm providing you uh, sketches of what a black hole is like, and we'll see that you know black holes are, are obviously have been uh, detected. And now the third and perhaps the most intriguing and most important property of a black hole is uh, because it exemplifies the interaction between matter and the shape of space. So this is a reconceptualization that uh, Einstein offered us. He, um, you know, Newton was able to explain what gravity does, but he couldn't tell us what gravity is. Why is it that something that has mass exerts a force of gravity is not something that Newton could explain. But Einstein's theory of general relativity explains that beautifully. And what it is, it's a very geometric theory. So the idea is that our entire universe is a four dimensional sheet that's called space time. And what gravity is, is the mutual interaction between the deformations, the curvature and the shape of space of time produced by the presence of mass. So you can think of, and you must have all seen these analogies, you know, big rubber sheet, you drop a ball into it and you can see sort of the curvature. So gravity is really um, the effect of matter on the shape of space and the curvature that it generates. So now if there was no matter in the universe, then space time would be completely flat. And now there's a little sketch that shows you that if you know the sun, what is the kind of curvature that it caused, the kind of dent that it makes in the shape of space. And now if I look at a neutron star, which is much more compact, much more dense than the sun, then notice that it causes a deeper divot, a deeper uh, pothole in the shape of space time. And now by extension, um, black holes are much more dense than neutron stars and they cause a puncture in space time, okay? So this is another way to understand the, uh, the gravity of a black hole and the gravity of the black hole understood in terms of how Einstein would want us to think about gravity. So Einstein really sort of, you know, redefined gravity as a relationship between matter and the shape of space. And that's what was so radical. So this is a lovely uh, XKCD cartoon that I think kind of explains to you within the solar system, you know, it's a little cartoon that shows you what is the curvature of space that is produced by the uh, various parts of our solar system. Obviously the sun produces the deepest divot. It's not shown, it's off the, off the edge of the paper, but you can see the Jupiter, which is the most massive is giving you sort of a big, so, you know, there's no escape. And what is interesting is that every piece of matter in the universe will pockmark and will generate its own little divot and its own little uh, uh, curvature. And, um, and basically, um, therefore, we live in the universe and therefore you can see how lensing works immediately, right? So if you have all these huge aggregates of dark matters, clusters of galaxies, little galaxies with their own independent gal um, dark matter halos, they all cause pockmarks on the fabric of space-time. And remember, space-time is the universe. That is where we live. There's nothing above it, there's nothing below it. So light has to traverse from, uh, from distant objects has to traverse each and every pothole. And what the shape actually contains, if you will, is an encoding or an imprint of every pothole that it has encountered. And so the deeper the pothole, the, the more dramatic the imprint, and that's how we are able to reconstruct the distribution. So what we are really reconstructing is the pattern of potholes, right, uh, in space-time, when we are undoing this lensing and uh, with the maps that I showed you. So one of the intriguing things that I'm not gonna spend time today at all um, is that something, because I told you that the universe is the four dimensional sheet, time is mixed up in all of this. So the nature of time is altered near black holes. So time slows down for an observer that is, would have the sad fate of falling into a, a black hole. Okay, but what are the empirical ways? How did black holes really, how did they become real, okay? So let's go back to our sort of schematic understanding of what's going on. 
try to put these things together, try to put the puncture in space time with the escape speed being light, all of that, you know, let's put that together. Then we see that a black hole is characterized by some region. So there's a region around the black hole. So there's this puncture in space time where the shape of space is extremely distorted, high curvature. So then there's a region outside where even light cannot escape. It would get captured in limbo and it would be there forever. Then there's a region where light would graze past and get bent and get lensed, which we, would, we could detect. And then there's a region interior to this light orbit, which is called the photon radius that you see marked here as a full light orbit. If you deviate slightly from that and you go inwards and you cross this region called the event horizon, this event horizon is um, a defined region for a black hole that is proportional to its mass. The size of this event horizon is proportional to the mass of the black hole. And once a light ray or anything for that matter crosses the event horizon, it's the point of no return. Okay, so, and we have no, we will have um, no information uh, about it. I mean, you know, there are intricacies on whether this information, it turns out that, you know, you don't actually lose the information. It's just that we no longer know how to recover that information or how it's stored. So the most compelling evidence for a black hole comes from the impact of the black hole at the center of our own galaxy. So it's a dormant black hole and the, uh, it, its gravitational influence on the orbits of stars right around the center of our galaxy. So this is real data. This is data from Andrea Getz's group. So I wanna give a shout out. So this is the work that was awarded the Nobel Prize this year, Andrea Getz, uh, Reinhard Genzel, and Roger Penrose's work on black holes. So this is data from Andrea Getz's group where you see the clock. And so there was a little red blob and we were all very excited because we thought it might be actually gobbled. It was a, a blob of gas. And we thought, you know, uh, this dormant black hole might have a dramatic feeding episode. It didn't, but we hope this is blob will come back in the future and we might see some interesting effects. So the other uh, observational evidence that was really neat and uh, really quite incredible was mapping of the shadow of a black hole getting really up close to that light orbit region. And that was recently done using interferometry, using leveraging the entire surface of the earth like a single dish of a radio telescope. Of course, it was done cleverly by using radio telescopes dotted around, uh, eight of them dotted everywhere uh, on the surface of the earth. And this is the shadow of um, a supermassive black hole that is six, almost seven billion times the mass of the sun at the center of a galaxy called M87. And this was released a couple of years ago by the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration. So this is again, you know, it ratifies our understanding, this whole structure and the geometry of the black hole and what it, how light behaves and so on. So that was direct proof that our ideas of, um, of the regions around the black hole and their gravitational influence uh, actually hold up. So the question is, where do supermassive black holes? I mentioned that almost every galaxy appears to host one. And so um, let me just show this uh, slide again. So this is a Hubble Space Telescope image of a galaxy. We are going right into the heart of that galaxy. This is all real data. And at some point we will get to the artist's um, um, schematic because we cannot resolve right down into the heart of the galaxy. But what you see here is a swirling reservoir of gas that is shown in red, and the black hole is sitting right at the center, and you see a jet of um, energy and matter that's being pushed up, and the black hole sitting at the center is actually feeding, and so it's actually the gas around the innermost region is glowing, and that's how you detect black holes. And, uh, but they appear, uh, in two sort of states. Uh, for example, the black hole in the center of the Milky Way, as I mentioned, is dormant. There's really not that much gas around. There's no swirling gas around. So um, there is no illumination. The illumination right around comes from the dying gasps of gas that are being pulled in by the gravity of the black hole that are getting heated and they start to glow. So you start seeing the sort of the glow from the gas that's falling in, if you have gas. If you don't have gas, you don't have such a detection. And then you just have to use the motions of stars as we saw for the Milky Way. 
So the cases where you can see this gas swirling in, uh, you see them as very bright objects. These objects are called quasars. In fact, they are even brighter than the entire galaxy. They outshine all the stars in a galaxy. That's how bright they are. These are literally cosmic beacons and we see them way out into the early universe. So what I've shown you so far, I've mentioned that there are black holes that, the, that are the end points of the evolution of stars. So those range in mass from a few times the mass of our sun to about 30, 40, 50 times the mass of our sun. And then I mentioned the supermassive black holes that reside in the centers of galaxies. And those are above a million times the mass of the sun. That's a typical mass. And they range out to a billion, even 10 billion times the mass of the sun. So there is, you might ask, so that's interesting. So how do you start from a few times the mass of the sun and how do you grow to about a million? So yes, black holes actually grow. And as I alluded to, by the accretion of gas, and they can also of course mer merge by colliding into each other as we will see. But then that tells you that there has to be an intermediate range of masses between several hundred to several thousands, tens of thousands, a uh, hundred thousand times the mass of the sun. And that mass range of black holes had been very elusive till very recently. So it was really bizarre. It was almost like you know learning the sequence of a human life and just seeing the infant photos and then seeing sort of your graying sort of geriatric photos and kind of missing entire teenage years and early adulthood. Uh, uh, but it turns out one of the reasons we were not detecting these intermediate mass black holes is perhaps we were looking for them in the wrong places. We were still looking for them in the centers of galaxies. It turns out that the first detection, one of the first detections uh, is actually, as you see this white circle here, it's from Chandra Space Telescope data. So this is X-ray gas that is glowing around a feeding black hole not as bright as a quasar because it's, a, it's outside a galaxy center where there's not much gas to, um, uh, to actually grab onto. And also its mass is much lower. So the luminosity that comes out, you know, the strength of gravity, everything scales with the mass of the black hole. So this is the, one of the first intermediate mass black holes. And since then, you know, Hubble has been turning up, uh, Hubble Space Telescope data has been turning up evidence for uh, other intermediate mass uh, black holes. This is just a nice movie that was made with the press release for this candidate because you know this was such an elusive um, candidate uh, mass range. And we believe that the only way in which you were likely to detect these guys was by, um, I'll turn down the music, it's a bit woo woo and spacey, which we don't really need. Um, uh, but we believe that perhaps the only way we would detect these intermediate mass black holes because they would be sort of wandering away from the center is if a star strayed uh, close. And this would be a complete chance encounter, right? And uh, then there would be a disruption of that star and you would see a flare and these are called tidal disruption events. And these events, uh, disruption events by supermassive black holes have been detected already. And now we are increasingly detecting slightly lower mass black holes that are also ripping apart stars that come precariously close. Okay, so um, I already mentioned that, you know, you can, um, we can envision a growth history for black holes starting off of stellar mass black holes, accreting gas and then growing in mass and building up mass and then over time, arriving at a million to a billion times the mass of the sun, these black holes that we're detecting are the centers of most, if not all galaxies. So, and I already mentioned that the way we think black holes grow is primarily by accretion of gas. So this is a cross section from a simulation of a disk, that red disk that we saw in the outer schematic. is a cross sectional view of how the gas probably funnels in and feeds the black hole, which is at the center of this. But we also know that black holes will grow by directly colliding with each other. And so that happens when you have two galaxies like shown in this simulation from my former PhD student, Pedro Capello's uh, work, that you have two spiral galaxies, both of which have central black holes that are glowing. There's a lot of gas in spiral galaxies. So they are, they're sort of quasars, but these two galaxies are involved in a very violent collision course. They merge 
What you don't see in this image is the dark matter halo. There are dark matter particles that extend well beyond the light, but remember they are collisionless. So they just kind of, you know, they get dragged along by the gravity. And then you have the gas and the stars that collide. And then you have the black hole at the center, the two black holes actually collide. And to see, so this is a top view now of the, you know, we are starting off from where this collision ended. You have this one kind of holy mess where you have the two black holes that are captured pretty close to each other. And now we have a top down view of that inner region of that messy merger, merged galaxy. And what we are seeing here is a primary more massive black hole, and you have a secondary that is plopping onto it. And what is shown in the yellow is really, again, just the gas distribution around the center. And you see the second, uh, secondary black hole grinding slowly in, and because it's grinding through gas, it, it, the gas around starts to glow because it's feeding, and so it's yellow, it's shining. So we think this is a way in which we may be able to detect this happening live when a secondary is spiraling in, we might see some radiation that is coming from an off-center source to a central black hole. So you have a central one that's feeding and glowing, and then you have an off-center one that could be signposting a process like this. But what is incredible about this merger process, aside from what you might see electromagnetically, we will see something else. Because black holes are these punctures in space-time, when they merge, they cause tremors in space-time itself, and they are called gravitational waves. So this is a simulation, a state-of-the-art simulation from Manuela Campanelli and her group at Rochester. And this is another one of the same visualized differently from Franz Pretorius and his group at Princeton. And so these are two black holes that are merging and the churning of space-time that that generates. And this churn generates waves, kind of tremors in space-time that can be measured. And you might all remember that uh, these were measured. So black holes of any mass can collide. So two stellar mass black holes colliding and the resultant gravitational waves produced from that were detected by the LIGO collaboration. But before I show you that and remind you of that stupendous discovery that happened a few years ago, here is a wonderful visualization showing you what really gravitational waves will look like in space and time. So it's a distortion of the three dimensions of space and uh, over time. So you'll see this propagating gravitational wave. I love this graphic um, because it's so, uh, it's so beautiful. It shows you how gravitational waves will propagate. So you may all remember that the collision of two stellar mass black holes was detected by the LIGO collaboration. And, um, and by now they have about 50 events and you see that in this plot, which is the black hole graveyard on, um, so that gives you from those collisions, from the gravitational waves um, uh, that are detected from that collision, we can actually measure the masses of the two black holes before they merged, as well as their final uh, mass, merged mass. So we have a really good inventory. We have about 50 events now, and it's really remarkable. This was a prediction of um, Einstein's theory of general relativity as well. Uh, and you might say that's great, but what about the supermassive cousins? So it turns out that they will merge and when they crash into each other, the gravitational waves that will be produced will have much lower frequency. And so you need these detectors to be in space to actually uh, measure them. And so that is what is planned in the near future by uh, a European uh, led and NASA collaborating mission called LISA. It's a space interferometry uh, mission that to detect um, colliding supermassive black holes. And so in LIGO, you had this interferometer arms that were about four kilometers. And for LISA, they are going to be 2.5 million kilometer arms. And that's the, specul that's the specification that you need to detect these very low frequency gravitational waves from the much more massive black holes. And so now I want to talk in closing, I want to talk a little bit about um, my own research and the particular questions that have occupied me. And that has to do with the origin of the first black holes. As I mentioned, there's an automatic channel, the end states of stars that we believe produces these sort of, they produce small seeds. 
And it turns out to make the supermassive black holes, there's a timing issue. It takes too long for these seeds to grow, to become supermassive black holes, to explain the quasars that we see very, very, uh, that turn on very early on in the universe. So you need ways to make black holes that are massive from the get-go, whose birth masses are already quite high. And so me and many others have proposed many different ways for doing this. And one of the ways for doing this are called direct collapse black holes, where from the get-go, you bypass the formation of a star uh, in some of these scenarios, and you can form a seed black hole that is 10,000 times the mass of the sun right away, in which case they can become supermassive black holes very, very soon. And what is really exciting about this is that these two different uh, well, more than two, multiple channels for making uh, black hole seeds is something that the James Webb Space Telescope can actually test and uh, verify whether you know these two channels are actually occurring simultaneously in the universe or not. And the reason the James Webb Space Telescope is particularly uh, special, well, first of all, really excited that it's uh, going to be launched on time. Uh, the revised timeline as of this year, which in October or so it's gonna be launched. And it has uh, a set of filters, a new set of eyes looking into the universe in the infrared, you know, which allows you to see the universe in, um, through eyes which are between one and 30 microns. So this is, you know, uh, this will allow us to penetrate through the dust and catch what is happening in the very, very early universe. The early universe was very dusty, so we can cut through the dust and see right through to the formation of the first galaxies and the first black holes. And why do we wanna see that? Because we have these theoretical models and understanding, and here I'm showing some work from one of my recent PhD students, Angelo Riccardi, and what you are seeing as stars is actually a, the evolution of a population of black holes, how they grow. They start off with very tiny masses, and over time, what you see up there in the clock is the time, they end up on this diagram that you see with little sticks. Those are real data points that are measured for the nearby supermassive black holes. So I'll run this again to give you a feeling. So we have these models that um, encapsulate how a black hole assembles and grows in tandem with the galaxy that hosts it, you know, through the mergers and through gas accretion. And so we can make very, um, very, very precise uh, predictions for the various stages and what you should see and populations, like how many uh, kinds of black holes active and passive you should see and so on. And you know, I wanted to mention this because it's kind of uh, nostalgic. When I was in graduate school 20, more than 20 years ago now, we did not, all of this that I've, taught you, uh, I've talked to you today is something we've understood in the last decade or the last 15 years. So 20 years ago, we barely knew about the local black holes and we had a handful of quasars. We didn't have enough information to start building the kind of rich histories of populations. But what we knew is that the properties of the black hole and that of the galaxy that hosts it are somehow linked. And that was a puzzle because the black hole's effect is restricted to its event horizon. How can it influence uh, stars that are in the inner part of our galaxy that lie well outside the horizon. How do you couple? The black hole is important, but its gravity dominates only in the innermost region because for a gal galaxy, the mass in stars and the mass of the dark matter take over that of the black hole very quickly. So for the Milky Way, the mass of the black hole is 4 million times the mass of the sun, and the mass of the total galaxy, including stars and dark matter, is about 10 to the 12 times the mass of the sun. So that in terms of mass, it does doesn't really uh, count for all that much, except in the inner regions, it punches more than its own weight. So what I realized when I was in graduate school was that there had to be a way to couple something about the black hole at very large distances relevant to the stars. And so one idea was that black holes, some of the energy of black holes that is tapped and it drives out outflows. And so this was something that uh, predicted um, um, with my collaborators, we predicted this, and it was a peculiar signature. So the idea is that you would see some offset blobs of gas. And I was really excited to see that a couple of years ago, this was detected. Not only was it detected, what was really uncanny was the geometry. It really matched the sketch of uh, what we expected. So in closing, I want to uh, tell you that the open questions, there are many open questions for black holes that have to do with their formation, their fueling, 
their feedback, which is the, you know, the interaction with the environment on various scales, and that James Webb Space Telescope and LISA are going to fundamentally shift our uh, current um, understanding. So we have theory, we have simulations, and we have observational predictions for all these upcoming missions. So we have very detailed predictions. I'm not gonna spend time on that, but um, in closing, I just want to let you know that you know, there is much excitement that is expected, uh, many breakthroughs and discoveries, and who knows, our current understanding might actually change radically with uh, JWST um, and LISA. So I'll just stop here and uh, thank you so much. And I look forward to your questions. That was terrific. Thank you so much. That was a journey. Loved it. And questions have been flowing in. So let's let's jump right into them. Um, Sorry, I went over by a few minutes. I always get a little carried away when I you know, start launching into maps. <laughs> That and I always tell myself that I should hold myself back, but you know I think there are many other map nuts out there, so hopefully it was all right. It's absolutely all right. All right. So here's the first question, and connecting uh, the two the two themes in your in your talk, how do scientists know that dark matter is a particle and not a distortion in space time or a misunderstanding of gravity? That's a great question. So uh, both of those avenues are actively explored. So one is you can imagine, right, uh, that what if all the dark matter uh, were little primordial black holes? And so that's a very active field of uh, research, that proposal. So at the moment, it's um, uh, it would be fair to say that we don't have um, any substantial evidence that, uh, um, you know, uh, ratifies that picture. As for the picture of whether we might have misunderstood the nature of gravity itself, I think that's a very actively um, uh, discussed option. The problem is that you know the current models, cold dark matter models, this model uh, of dark matter as this collisionless fluid type dark matter, it is so sophisticated and it is so mature. And the history of how we built that theory phenomenologically is very complex. So the theory has lots of parameters. And as we were uh, observing more and more phenomena on different scales, you know, we were able to kind of alter the theory to accommodate. And we've been able to accommodate pretty much everything. And as I alluded to earlier, there are some small cracks that have shown up. And recently, uh, there was work that we did with some collaborators that was published last year in Science. And you can look that up, um, where we think we might have found something very, very interesting that needs to be followed up much more. You know, once again, with all these mismatches, right? So the way the uh, current limits of our theories show up, is that there will be sets of observations that don't match, that are anomalous compared to the predictions that don't fit. But the question is, do these uh, observations do, uh, not fit because of the limits of our conceptual model or the nature of our model itself? So that's something that has to be ferreted out. And um, uh, so yes, there is an alternative proposed uh, there are modifications to uh, Newtonian dynamics. There are these theories, um, alternative theories of gravity. And there is one interesting uh, theory that is being actively worked on. And, uh, and I, it's very challenging to come up with alternatives. Um, but I think um, you know, I'm completely open-minded. Uh, and as, as long as we have empirical evidence, and as I said, many people like me are involved in sort of stress testing this current model that we have, the current paradigm, to see what are the limits and to then understand if the limits really come from the conceptual basis of the theory or, or our methods of investigation. So that's a kind of a, an intricate, complex problem. But yes, there is an alternative. And the reason we need to be open-minded, other than the fact that in science, all knowledge is provisional, and so we have to be open-minded. It's nature by nature, science is contingent. Is second, we also fundamentally know, we believe that all um, theories, all forces in the universe are unified. Uh, but we know that, you know that we don't have a quantum theory of gravity. We don't have a description of gravity on the smallest scales. So there's a gap that we already know. There's a conceptual gap. And we know that you know, Einstein and many others, um, you know, Hawking and collaborators, all of these people have tried to come up 
and people who currently work in string theoretical models, they're really trying to come up with a quantum theory of gravity. We don't have that. So we know that our current theory and our current description is incomplete. So that's another reason to always stay open-minded, aside from the fact that you know scientific temper behooves us to remain open-minded. That's an excellent question. Oh, thank you. That was great. So and here's uh, another question, which probably is going to push you where scientists don't like to go, but I'll do it for the sake of our lovely online audience. Uh, for more than a decade, scientists have been saying they would know what dark matter is in the next 10 years. How close do you think we actually are? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. I don't want to. I'm not a betting kind of person. I'm too cautious, so I never bet on things and so on. But, um, you know, I, I can only give you the story of the detection of gravitational waves, right? I mean, the LIGO collaboration, these people were working for 40 years, okay, before they actually detected gravitational waves. So, and obviously, you know, they detected waves when finally the instrumentation was the sensitivity of the instrumentation match the phenomenon, right? And that's how, boom, right? They they immediately detected them. They opened their, and the story is quite remarkable, right? That the detectors went online, uh, they hit the sensitivity bar, bam, they opened up for data and they immediately detected the, their first event and it was whopping signal. So, I mean, it could be that we are not quite looking at the right places. So I think this, you know, there's been an obsession looking for WIMPs, these weakly interacting massive particles. And now there's been a shift and we are starting to look at axions, these sort of lower mass particles, that, which will be searched in a different way. So I think that, uh, you know, given uh, the kind of frustration that we all have, you know, why haven't we detected it? You know, I would like to know the mass, you know, like yesterday or 10 years ago, whatever. Um, I think that it might be that because these parameters are unknown, the mass of the particle is unknown. I mean, there are ranges and so on, but parameter space, we've been able to rule out parameter space, but we've not really succeeded in kind of nailing it down, um, uh, nailing down the particle itself. So I think it could be um, that we've not been looking at the right places. Uh, and so we need to explore. And I think this direction of looking for axions uh, with many different methods is very exciting. And um, let's see. And if it turns out that we turn out empty there too, then I think um, that gives us uh, much more impetus to seriously rethink uh, the particle nature of dark matter. Oh, very good. But I very mean, good. I would like to think that this is going to happen in my lifetime. Just as I think that the LISA detection of gravitational waves from colliding supermassive black holes, I would love that window to be open. There are two things, these are my two sort of death wishes. I would like to know the nature of uh, dark matter, and I would like to have seen the uh, uh, gravitational waves, the detected waves, the pattern from the collision of two supermassive black holes, and I would totally die in peace. <laughs> oh, that's, that sounds like it's gonna happen, I'm calm. Um, all right, here we go. Uh, one last big online question, then we'll do the speed round to, to, to close out. So the, this is a little more philosophical. So once we thought the Milky Way uh, constituted the entire universe, what current view do you think might seem quaint 100 years from now? Gosh, uh, who knows? Uh, I think, I know it's, it's radical, right? Even like 100 years ago, we thought that the universe was uh, that the Milky Way was the only galaxy and that constituted our universe. Well, I mean, I'm obviously tempted to say multiverse, uh, that there may be other universes out there, but I want to be very careful and say, you know, it's a belief. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not clear to me that it can be empirically substantiated and be on the same footing as um, other things that we know. Having said that, I mean, I always like to add the caution because as someone who's really interested in the history of ideas, look, I don't think that Copernicus ever imagined that we humans would come up with Voyager 1 and 2 that would actually exit the solar system, right? So the limits, our imagination, our minds are incredible, but they also impose limits. So I don't know, maybe uh, we will discover that there are multiple universes out there 
and that we will have evidence that they uh, that they exist. I mean, in principle, of course, right? We all know that in principle, mathematically speaking, there could, there likely, I mean, there's an infinite number of other universes and possibilities. There's another one in which, you know, Priya is giving a talk at the Perimeter Institute wearing not like uh, glossy white beads, but, you know, bright red beads, right? So all possibilities uh, can be manifest uh, in principle. But I think the one, um, I think it would be really exciting if a hundred years from now, what uh, gets figured out is that there are um, other universes. Of course, closer in within our universe, I don't think it's gonna take hundred years, which is why I didn't go there first, which is, you know, other forms of life. Um, I think detecting other forms of life, um, they don't necessarily have to map on to us. I mean, I think we shouldn't, our, we shouldn't limit our imaginations with just what we look like. And I don't know, my personal favorite from one of my favorite books called Lumen is that, you know, I'm always dreaming of sentient plants. Don't ask me why, I love plants, but it's quite possible that, you know, um, that we may have to open our mind and that, but I think that's gonna happen less than a hundred years from now. 100 years from now, maybe multiple universes. Oh, you're going to have people thinking now for sure. That's great. OK, let's finish up with the lightning round. I think it's six questions. Uh, just one answer or just a quick phrase, just for fun. Here we go. If you weren't an astrophysicist, what would you be? Oh, for a nanosecond, I consider being an architect. No, very good. One scientist, dead or alive, you'd most want to meet. Oh, so uh, it's the Indian um, uh, scientist Aryabhatta. All right. Uh, favorite equation? Favorite equation, Einstein's field equations. Biggest influence on your career, scientific or otherwise? Oh, this is a hard one. Um, there are so many influences, but I think I would take um, Dr. Nirupama Raghavan, who um, was the director of the Nehru Planetarium in India. I used to be a very avid amateur astronomer and she got me hooked into research when I was a young teenager. And, um, you know, she kind of saw something in me before I or anybody else saw uh, sort of a capacity, um, capacity to dream and the capacity to, uh, and facility with mathematics and things like that. So I know it was because of her that I went to MIT on a scholarship, and I think my life uh, uh, followed a completely different trajectory. Oh, and that the last question falls right into that. Most important trait for a successful physics career? Oh, um, it's so hard uh, to pick one, uh, but I think um, the, the I don't know, I'm torn between two things and I'm trying desperately to combine them. Um, one, um, one is definitely um, a resilience uh, and, uh, and, and the, uh, the other um, is the capacity to imagine and dream. Oh, that's perfect. Uh, Professor, thank you so much. A wonderful talk. We can't uh, thank you enough. Uh, online audience, uh, we will talk to you again in a month. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And have a lovely evening.